everyone. My name is Kathleen Sprose Cummings. I'm the director of the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism at the University of Notre Dame, where I also teach in the departments of American Studies and History. Um, on behalf of the staff of the Kushwa Center and on behalf of the program committee, I am delighted to welcome you all to the 11th Triennial Conference on the History of Women Religious. <laughs> Admittedly, it's a bit of a belated welcome. The conference has been off to a great start for uh, most of today, and I know that the panels that I was able to attend were excellent, so um, uh, thanks to all of you for being here for our opening keynote. I just want to say a few words about the conference. The Conference on the History of Women Religious had its beginnings over 30 years ago in 1987. It was that year that the Kushwa Center hosted a colloquium across the street at Notre Dame on the history of women religious in the United States, and CHWR emerged out of that meeting. Um, there were many sisters present who were historians and archivists of their communities, as well as two lay women, and I want to acknowledge um, Margaret Susan Thompson, who I believe was president at that 1987 meeting, and Sister Mary Evans, um, if she is here. Sir and okay, I was gonna, that was my next question. Judith Cetera to ask if there was anyone else, <laughs> anyone else present. Florence, you were there too? Wonderful. Uh, Right, that was, that was 30 years ago, so welcome back, and thank you, and, okay, and um, of course, at that meeting, these and other scholars discussed how uh, to build a network that would foster research and publication in the field. Since it published its first issue of the newsletter in 1988 and hosted the first triennial conference, the College of St. Catherine, in 1989, this organization has drawn together a community of women and men dedicated to preserving the historical record of vowed women from the Middle Ages to the present and to integrating their stories into larger narratives of their times and places. CHWR was run by Sister Karen Kennelly until her retirement in 2013 and since then, administration of the CHWR has been entrusted to the Kushwa Center at Notre Dame. Um, so I'd like to uh, begin by uh, thanking, you can imagine a conference of this complexity and magnitude takes quite a bit of time and effort to plan. So I just want to recognize the Kushwa Center staff for um, what they have done to make things go um, as smoothly as they are going. Madonna Noak um, may have slipped out, but uh, she's the, the person on, on the other end of many emails, uh, I know for many of you, um, the administrative coordinator at the Kushwa Center, Shane Ulbrich, Kushwa Center's assistant director, and also Maggie Elmore, um, Kushwa's postdoctoral fellow who took planning this conference as her primary charge this year. Maggie, are you, is, has Maggie slipped out as well? Well, we'll have other opportunities to thank them. There she is. So I, um, I also want to introduce and thank Pete Chaika, Kushwa Center's other postdoctoral fellow um, who has helped with this conference a bit, but his primary responsibility was planning our Global History Conference, which took place just a few months ago. So this is actually the second international uh, uh, conference the Kushwa Center has hosted in the last three months. So if we look a little tired, that's why. Um, but anyway, I'd just like to thank um, all of them. It's a great team at the Kushwa Center, a privilege to work with my colleagues every day, and I'm grateful to them for all that they have done. Uh, not an official member of the Kushwa Center, as in uh, not on the payroll at all, uh, but she may as well have been this year, is Professor Maggie McGinnis from LaSalle University, who uh, is my partner um, in, on the steering committee of the Conference for the History of Women Religious, and this year as a Mother Theodore Guerin Fellow, spent quite a bit of time at the Kushwa Center and was instrumental in planning this conference and, um, and in general thinking about the field of uh, the study of women religious. I want to acknowledge and thank the other members of the conference's program committee. As you know, it's, a, it's an excellent program and it required a lot of hard work about this time last year after we received an overwhelming response to the call for papers and had to go through um, all of the proposals and uh, figure out the puzzle pieces to put them all together to be where we are now. So I'd like to thank Mary Beth Fraser Connolly, um, Cara French, uh, Deirdre Raftery, 
Sister Sally Witt, and of course the chair of the program committee, Tom Zeznik. So could we give them all a big round of applause, please? It's a particular pleasure to be here at St. Mary's College as it celebrates its 175th anniversary this year. And so I want to also extend thanks to our collaborators at St. Mary's for supporting this conference, including the staff of campus and community events, especially Richard Baxter, Gabriella Maxwell, and Elise Paul, the Center for Spirituality and its director, Arlene Montevecchio, as well as the VP Vice President for Mission, Judy Fian, who were instrumental in planning uh, the Vesper service earlier this afternoon. And of course, the Sisters of the Holy Cross, especially Sister Veronique and Sister Charlotte Wagner, who preach beautifully at this afternoon's Vesper service. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker. The title of this year's conference is Commemoration, Preservation, Celebration. As we began the conference today and look forward to the days ahead, we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Ann Little, Professor of History at Colorado State University, as our keynote speaker. And indeed, when I think about the purpose of CHWR from those, that early meeting in 1987 to integrate the stories of Catholic women religious more broadly into narratives, I really uh, can't think of a, a more appropriate speaker. And I'm thinking back to the conversations we had on the program committee last summer about who we could get to help us think about how these stories enter into the bigger picture of, um, of American history, North American history. And um, again, we're just thrilled that Dr. Ann Little is here with us tonight. Ann earned her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, and before joining Colorado State, she taught at the University of Dayton for four years. She is a scholar of North American history, specializing in the history of women, gender, and sexuality. Anne is the author of numerous scholarly articles and book chapters, as well as two books. Her first book, Abraham in Arms, War and Gender in Colonial New England, was published by University of Pennsylvania Press in 2007. Um, her most recent book, The Many Captivities of Esther Wheelwright, was published in 2016 by Yale University Press. And I know, as is the case with many of you in this room, I uh, taught that book uh, this past year, and it really helped in, in my Catholics in America class, and it really helped me think in new ways, not only about the history of women religious, but also about the history of Catholicism in North America. Um, Anne writes about academia, history, and feminism at her blog, Historian, and she is active and well-known on Twitter under that handle. And in fact, as soon as I'm done, I'm going to be posting the picture that I took of us um, saying, I met Historian in person. So um, <laughs> I'm very excited to have done that. Speaking of Twitter, if you do, if you are on Twitter, please tweet about the conference under the hashtag CHWR2019. Anne was a Dana and David Dornsa Fellow at the Huntington Library in 2014 and 2015. She has served as guest editor of Early American Studies, and she visited the Royal Archives at Windsor Castle in the summer of 2017 as a guest of the Georgian Papers Program, a project which, which seeks to digitize collections and bring scholars to study 18th and 19th century British royal families' private papers. Anne is currently researching a book on free women's bodies and politics in the age of Atlantic revolutions. I could certainly go on and on about her, her publications um, and her other accomplishments, but I want to leave as much, possible, much time as possible for Anne's remarks and for your questions this evening. The title of Anne's talk is Open, Vast, and Inclusive, Catholic Women's History is Early North American History. Please join me in welcoming Professor Anne Little. can't help but think I'm going to be a big disappointment after that glowing introduction. <laughs> uh, since this is an after-dinner talk, I'll try to keep it lively. <laughs> but if some of you need to nod off, that's okay, too. I won't take it personally. Um, uh, before I begin my talk today, I'd like to thank Kathleen Sprouse Cummings uh, and Madonna Noak uh, and, and the Kushwa Center staff for, for inviting me and for thinking to include me in this conference. Uh, but especially I'd like to offer my thanks to the generations of women religious whose generosity and openness to an outsider like me has granted me access to worlds far beyond my own. <clears throat> One of the reasons I was so delighted to receive this invitation to speak to you all tonight is that one of my low-key low but persistent interests uh, throughout my career so far 
Um, oh, I, I should say, um, sorry, I need to figure out this. I want to give you, before I start my talk formally, um, excuse me, I want to give you a little overview of what I'm going to talk about so that you can keep track of where I am in my talk. <laughs> I think that that works really well with students and even with um, people who have not been students for a really long time, just so they understand where I'm going. But I'm going to be dilating a little bit on my uh, themes of open, vast, and inclusive. The first two uh, points of my discussion, open and vast, are going to focus on questions of historiography and my view uh, as an early Americanist who's ventured into Catholic history. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk to you a little bit about um, some of the decisions I made and some of the connections I made in my book, The Many Captivities of Esther Wilwright. Um, and then we'll all go back to our dorm rooms <laughs> for an early night because we have a very busy two and a half days ahead of us. Um, so one of the reasons I was so des delighted to uh, receive this invitation to speak to you all is that one of my low-key interests throughout my career so far uh, has been Anglo-American anti-Catholicism. Uh, I discovered that, uh, in uh, at least skimmed the surface of that in the research beginning with my first book, and I was able to dive a little bit more into it with my second book, although none of that really made it into the book. So I'm, I'm happy to bring to you some really... Um, uh, florid and even almost pornographic images, <laughs> not literally, not literally, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but really uh, some obscene images that, that I think are at the roots of Anglo-American uh, anti-Catholicism. Uh, and so that's going to be the, the topic of my, the first portion of my lecture here, uh, being open as opposed to being closed in the way that these Anglo-American anti-Catholics were. Um, a particular fascination in these verbal and visual depictions of Catholic delusion and cruelty from their perspective, uh, of course, are the depictions of women's bodies, uh, virtuous Protestant mothers versus hypocritical nuns and monstrous bare-breasted gorgons. So I want to show you some of these. Um, they're not pleasant, but they are kind of fascinating. This was the image that kind of got me interested in this topic. This is from a broadside published, as you can see, in 1724, uh, depicting the, the, the death of Father Sebastian Rall uh, at Norwich Walk with the Norwich Walk Wabanaki in a little known and long forgotten war in early New England known as Greylock's War or Dummer's War. Um, and as you can see here, um, there are sort of these victorious English soldiers standing over the fallen bodies of Wabanaki men who are also kind of falling into the Kennebec River, I think, here. And the image of Rall is very indistinct, but he's the little white face you can see inside the, the fortress, inside the garrison there. Um, he's depicted as cowardly and unmanly, hiding right behind the, the, the Indian men who at least had the courage to fight. But interestingly enough here, you notice the flag that's flying. That's never a flag that actually would have flown over anything. But, but that's meant to show the um, disturbing and um, unholy relationship between Catholicism, right? You can see the crosses on the flag with Native American resistance to Euro-American and especially uh, Anglo-American rule. But these images, of course, have a much deeper and um, richer history than just this, this crude woodcut. You see images like this throughout colonial New England, throughout 18th century New England presses, but it's really the British presses uh, where they're getting their ideas here. So for example, this is a detail from a scheme of popish cruelties uh, published in 17, or sorry, 1681. And as you can see here, uh, there are Catholic men who are depicted as raping and then slaughtering the, the children of virtuous Protestant mothers. Um, it says, thus bravely we two, lusts at once, uh, we two lusts at once fulfill. We ravish first and the next moment kill. And you can see a young woman screaming, oh, pity our poor babes, while a, a monstrous man sort of is swinging a, a, an infant by the ankles saying, I'll end your heretical brood. Yeah. <laughs> These, I mean, I, I just, I haven't, I'm not making any claims here about exactly, you know, everything that this means. I just, I collect these as I'm going along in my research, and I like to think about what does this say about women, 
what does this say about anti-Catholicism? What does this say about the Protestant imaginary Catholic in their minds? Here's one that's uh, even more obscene. This is from the solemn mock procession of the Pope, cardinals, Jesuits, friars, etc., through the city of London. So this is one of these carnivalesque uh, celebrations, apparently, that happened where they, they had a bunch of floats that went through. And towards the end of the line, they have this one here, uh, which, as you can see in the top right, the woman who's sort of presiding over this float is, is called the Pope's Whore. Uh, and she has a court of, as it says, courtesans in ordinary, who are religious women. And then it says here, for 10 years, I was Holy Father's miss. He was the church's head, and I was his. I was a, I was a cursed, strapping female princess. By me, the Catholic world was ruled, or since, and since, access to courts has been as to the pox, for the most part, by petticoats and smocks. So this is not only associating Catholicism with monstrous rule, but also even with disease, right? With, with sexually transmitted diseases, with, with uh, inappropriate sexuality. Um, really, I mean, this, this, this stuff, uh, it, it's, it's striking and shocking every time I find it. Um, I think I have just one more. I'll spare you any further. <laughs> but this one is, is rather magnificent here. This is from a 1711 broadside, anti-French as well as anti-Catholic. And really, untwining the anti-Gallicism and the anti-Catholicism is very difficult in this period in British history, of course, as you know. Uh, but this is allegedly the French assassin Giscard with the emblems of popery on the one hand and faction and party on the other. So, so popery is, is represented by a woman, a comely woman, high-breasted, lovely, uh, but obviously sort of, uh, you know, with her uh, miter and scepter and orb sort of representing this kind of monstrousness of female rule, of Catholic rule. And she's saying, by these uh, instruments, what does it say? By these two... These two worldly grandeur... Yes, sorry, I, I'm used to having a screen up here where I can read it off a little bit more closely. Um, but yes, you, you get the impression here. So you've got the, the lovely high-breasted young woman and then the, the sort of the monstrous gorgon with the snakes in her hair and the, the long breasts. Both of them, of course, though, should be not be tipped off by the chicken feet that they, <laughs> you know, these, these sort of chimerical creatures that they're meant to represent, right? Just the, the, the monstrousness, the filth, the disease, the, 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 the disgusting nature of, of women, women's rule, Catholicism, and popery, right? I mean, it's just... It's all there. Now, I wish I could announce that this kind of xenophobic misogyny has had its day. But alas, the internet is the modern gift that keeps religious prejudice and women hating alive, I have found. <laughs> but to return to a more distant past. Anglo-American Catholicism, much like the English and British anti-Catholicism that fed and fueled it, was focused on the supposed secrecy, autocracy, and sexual hypocrisy that Protestants claimed were at the heart of the church and its religious orders. Unsurprisingly, as we've seen in some of these images, the ugliest allegations focused on women's orders and what exactly went on inside these spaces, which were suspiciously merely for the fact of their, which were suspicious merely for the fact of their enclosure. For years, this anti-Catholicism not only shaped Anglo-American life in the 17th and 18th centuries, it powerfully informed the first generations of American historians in the 19th century as well, the vast majority of whom were university-educated wasps of the ruling class who shared their prejudices. We must all reject their example and remain open, therefore, to writing histories of people from different backgrounds and with different beliefs and perspectives than our own. So in this discussion of uh, being open, about being open as opposed to closed. I assure you that this portion of my address is, is aimed more at early Americanists rather than Catholic historians, or certainly historians of women's religious orders. Um, I've become something of an evangelist on this issue when talking to historians trained more like me as well uh, in colonial American history. So this brings me to my second uh, point in my lecture, which is vast. This is a snapshot I took of my Twitter account last night. Um, <laughs> as you can see here, 
do I have a little, I think I do have a highlighter. Up here, you see the little hashtag, Vast Early America. If you go on Twitter and search in the search box, and you can do this even if you don't have a Twitter account, um, search Vast Early America on Twitter or even on Instagram too, and you'll get all of the um, posts that people have made that also link to that hashtag. So as you can see, there's Philippe Halbert, who's a um, fascinating young historian at Yale who does lots of stuff with material culture and with um, early New France as well. This is an image of Holy Family Church, which I just discovered because of his uh, post, um, consecrated in 1799. This is the oldest continuously active Roman Catholic parish, and this is the church at Cahokia in Illinois, the old mission church. So that, that's hashtag vast early America. Now, it's, I, this is not my brainchild. This is, uh, this is to the credit of Karen Wolf, who is the director of the Omohundro Institute for Early American History and Culture, known as the OI for short. Uh, she is the person who inaugurated this hashtag on Twitter in 2016 that encapsulates part of her vision for the Institute, which is the premier scholarly organization for the study of early America. Um, so vast early America is, is her brainchild. This movement is meant to encourage early Americanists to reimagine North America before the emergence of the nation states that have defined it for the past two centuries, and to write histories of all the peoples who inhabited our continent from 1492 into the 19th century. Importantly, vast early America, or I should say, Hashtag vast early America um, is also a call for early Americanists. Is also a call for Americanists of all stripes to find sources as well outside of English language archives and to think creatively about writing histories that aren't necessarily based uh, even in written sources at all. While some early American historians find the centerlessness of hashtag vast early America to be intimidating. And it can be very intimidating to leave behind English language sources and the certainty of 1776 and all that. I think it's not only salutary, uh, but entirely necessary, uh, especially if we're going to continue to seek the support and attention of the American people moving through the 21st century and beyond. At least as important from my perspective uh, is that by widening our lens and by making all of North America our subject, from Baja California to the Gaspe Peninsula and from Puerto Rico to the San Juan Islands, we can tell so many new stories. Now, God bless the Founding Fathers, right? <laughs> the popularity of Hamilton and American Musical has shown once again that there are no American stories like Founders' Tales. Uh, and we will, we will read them, eat them up, you know, just buy any book with a Founding Fathers oil painting on it for forever. But some of us, a few of us, uh, and I think more and more Americans are eager to discover and tell some new stories with the surprising and fascinating sources that we can find when we look to archives outside the United States, perhaps in other languages, or to sources that aren't even written in language at all, right? Material objects, landscapes, images, et cetera. Now, historians of religion, I mean, vastness is great, right? It sounds great to just, like, blow up the world, let's, like, look at everything. But realistically, we, we do need to have some kind of boundaries, right? Any of you, of you who have read my book um, will know that sort of one of the sort of low-key themes through the book is that people are, like, happier and more productive when there are boundaries, <laughs> where there are limits, and that we can, we can actually achieve great things sometimes even from within very bounded and closed spaces. Um, but so historians of uh, America, historians of religion have to struggle with this balance uh, between, you know, how, how big are we going to go? How vast can we make this before it loses its coherence as a, a subject, whether that's American history, early America, Catholic history, whatever. Um, so John Butler, for example, who's one of the most eminent historians of early American Protestantism that some of you may, may know his work, he's one of these guys. He's, his recent work on American religion which is inclusive of Catholicism and Judaism through the 20th century, has, he's moved entirely into the 19th and 20th centuries recently to focus exclusively on modernity and urbanization. Um, he's among the, the greatest living historians of early American religion, but it appears that he felt compelled to abandon the 17th and 18th centuries in order to broaden the scope beyond 
Protestant dominations, right? In, denominations. He needs to sort of narrow his temporal focus or shift his temporal focus in order to include more different religious expressions. And Catholic historians are struggling with this as well. When I did a brief literature search uh, to prepare for this lecture, um, 25 and 30 years ago, I found some great articles that talked about the state of American Catholic history then, as it, uh, around the, the foundation of this conference, 1989, the early 1990s. Um, but a lot of the language that those historians use to sort of explain their field to American historians who are not Catholic historians is almost apologetic. Like, they use terms like hidden history or on the margins. Um, in the intervening decades, in part because of the labors of scholars like Leslie Woodcock Tentler, John McGreevy, Robert Orsi, and Kathleen Sprouse Cummings, among so many others, Catholic history appears to be more comfortable occupying more space in American history. And I really want to see more of that sort of expanding across the timeline as well. There's a fascinating article I found, too, by a Catholic historian uh, by the name, some of you I think know her, probably Sister Angeline Dries. Is, is that how I say her name? Dries. Oh, it is Dries. Okay. Uh, Sister Angeline Dries. Um, she's been more inclusive of early American Catholicism in her 2015 American Catholic History Association presidential address, uh, Perils of Ocean and Wilderness, which is subtitled A Field Guide to North American Catholic History. And this is a really brilliant, I thought, admirably wide-ranging essay that cites, among others, figures from John Gilmary Shea to Aldo Leopold and Pope Francis. Um, she outlines a, a very powerful case, I think, in this essay for environmental history as Catholic history. And for Catholic historians to follow the natural contours of rivers and mountain ranges when imagining a North American Catholic history, um, rather than the political borders that were imposed really only fairly recently when you think about it from an early Americanist perspective uh, by the nation states that emerged in North America in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. She also calls for a vision of American Catholic history that isn't subjected to hard chronological borders either. Um, she calls for a collaboration across time periods and across national boundaries to explore the Catholic relationships with land, water, and wilderness. American Catholicism has been, since its beginnings, a hashtag vast early America enterprise, one ranging the entire continent, or even the hemisphere, depending on how big you want to go, uh, and written in French, Spanish, and Portuguese, and sometimes even a little bit in English. As I'm fond of telling graduate students everywhere, speaking and reading another language is like having a superpower. <laughs> Whole new worlds open up. Just like you can drag out your eighth grade French like I did and write a book. It's really, you know, don't be intimidated. There are marvelous things called, you know, translators. And even Google Translate is not bad for helping you figure out if this document is even in the neighborhood of something you want to uh, copy or photograph. So just as American Catholic history is embracing a vaster future, so early America is too. Um, and I'm really happy to report that I no longer feel like Vox Clementis in Deserto, the voice of one crying in the wilderness of early Americanists. My very recent experiences co-editing a special issue of early American history on the subject of women and religion in the early Americas with Professor Nicole Eustace of New York University has been enormously encouraging. I'm very proud to report to you um, that uh, one, of, one of our goals was to ensure that we represented the emerging work of, on Catholic women's history. Uh, and we were able to publish fully one-third of the essays in this volume. Three essays out of a total of nine articles are based wholly or in part on Catholic women's history. Unsurprisingly, two of the three articles are based in Mexican and Peruvian convent records, right? So there's the importance of speaking and reading another language for you if you really want to be inclusive um, in early American and Catholic histories. Unsurprisingly, or sorry, I should say, in fact, two of our three authors in, in, a, in Catholic history in our volume are at this conference. Jessica Criales, so mark your programs here, will be talking about holy Indian women, the indigenous nuns of the Siete Principes convent in Oaxaca, Mexico, 1782 to 1870, on Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. in session 18. <laughs> Just if you want to mark your programs. 
Um, and Mitchell Oxford is another of our authors, and he'll be talking about power in portraiture, Catherine Spaulding and the Sisters of Charity in Nazareth in Kentucky. And that'll be tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock in session 15. Um, their work is representative of some of the creative, ambitious, and frequently transnational work that historians of early American religion are doing. So if you're interested in reading some of Jessica's and Mitchell's work, I'm very thrilled to report that you'll be able to do this in uh, our special issue, which is going to be published this fall on time, um, uh, in, in the special issue of Early American Studies in the fall. And I'll be happy to send you a link to that if you email me. And finally, I want to talk about inclusivity in my lecture tonight. And this is when I'd like to shift over and talk a little bit about what I uh, did or tried to do in my book about Esther Wheelwright uh, and why I think it might um, give us at least one map to thinking about American, uh, early American history and Catholic women's history as a, a new kind of way of, of being inclusive in our historical practice. One of the reasons I was drawn to writing about Esther Wheelwright from the beginning was that she lived in all three major North American cultures as near as we can tell, um, as close to being a native-born member of each community as possible. She was born in an Anglo-American community in early Massachusetts in what's now Maine, actually Wells, Maine. Um, she was abducted and then most likely adopted by the Wabanaki in 1703 uh, when she was age seven. The Wabanaki are a confederation of Algonquian-speaking native peoples in Acadia, Maine, Quebec, New Brunswick now. And then she became a student, and then a novice, and eventually a choir nun and mother superior in the Ursuline convent in Quebec, where she remained the rest of her life. So in addition to this remarkable boundary crossing for a girl child and young woman in early America, I mean, there are a few men who do this, and they, they get work as translators usually after they go back to Anglo-American civilization. Um, and there are, of course, French diplomats uh, who uh, come down and who work with Anglo-American populations. More commonly, though, I think, uh, you know, we think of the Jesuits, right, the master linguists who come to North America and devote their lives to missionary work with native peoples, but they don't tend to have as much uh, connection or uh, relationship with, with English-speaking peoples. Um, so, so this is really a remarkable story, I thought, that, that, that a young girl and young woman was, was doing all of this border crossing and language acquisition and, you know, shifting of, of cultures of, of her religious beliefs. Um, she was then, of course, elected Mother Superior uh, only after the British conquest, in the immediate wake of the British conquest in 1789, or sorry, 1759, uh, which is a move that I and her other biographers pretty much uh, understand was très, très politique. Um, but she did a pretty darn good job of it. Um, as most of you know better than I do, focusing on Catholic women's communities in North America is a reliable and an efficient means of engaging a truly open and hashtag vast early America vision of our field. Because of traditional English hostility to Catholicism, most Catholic history before the American Revolution is necessarily going to be outside of regions that were dominated politically or numerically by English-speaking people. So for almost the past two centuries, Catholic historians have been the ones writing a recognizable history of hashtag vast early America, and it's well past time for the historians of the Anglo-American Protestants to pay attention. In particular, centering my study on Catholic women allowed me to focus on the powerful connections between Wabanaki and French Canadian Catholicism. And that's what I'd really like to talk to you about now uh, with the rest of my talk here. I think that it's important not just to look at people in religious communities, not just men and women in religious communities, but women in particular. Because the difference that women make is that women see and include other women in their communities and in their labor. Um, and they end up being, I believe, more inclusive than the male communities, men's religious orders. Um, women see other women. Uh, and, and all of you who do women's history know that necessarily when we do women's history, even if we're doing histories of religious orders, women's religious orders, there's a lot of men's history involved, right? <laughs> 
Um, there's, there's a whole lot of men involved in the communities. In Catholic communities, of course, only men can say the masses, right? There's a father confessor. Um, so, so women's religious communities are, are almost by definition more inclusive and more inclined to, to see and acknowledge other women at work in their communities as well as outside their communities. So that's why I, I would argue that it's not just um, ca Catholic, it's not just religious history, Catholic religious history, but it's Catholic women religious that really open up this open and inclusive world for us. So my biography of Esther Wheelwright ended up being not just a biography of her, but really it was an opportunity for me to, to talk and write about women in all three of these different major North American cultures um, and the women and girls who surrounded her at every stage of her life. Um, so, you know, when I, when I found out about her, it was only after I finished graduate school. And um, I was kind of amazed that somebody so remarkable and interesting and, and obviously, you know, involved in leadership that I had never heard about her being trained as a young feminist scholar in the 1990s in graduate school. Um, but of course, <laughs> because she forgot pretty much how to read and speak English, um, and because she was Catholic, nobody teaching early American history in the 1990s thought it was important that I know about her necessarily. <laughs> but I didn't have to go far to find her. I found her portrait, her remarkable portrait, in the heart of sort of all traditional WASP scholarship, the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston, right? Um, <laughs> So, so the curator of paintings uh, there, Ann Bentley, was one of the first people I communicated with in, in my interest about Esther Wheelwright. And she, she pulled this out of the archives and she put it down on a big table in front of us. And she said, you know, Ann, I think this is a really special portrait because it was not only, it's not only, uh, they have a lot of portraits in the mass historical. Most of them are Puritan ministers and you know, Boston congregationalist merchants, right, men. There are a few portraits of women and families, but those were overwhelmingly commissioned by the fathers or the husbands or the future husbands of the women portrayed. And Ann Bentley said, I think this is special because it was almost undoubtedly commissioned by the woman herself, by the subject herself, and because of the tradition of artistry in the Ursuline convent, it probably was done by an amateur uh, painter in the convent, probably by a novice, a young painter. So it's really a special portrait. And they now have it hanging in a, a position of honor in one of their sort of first floor seminar rooms. So if you go to Boston and do any research there, please visit Esther for me. Um, I love this portrait too. Um, and part of it is my daughter's name is Alice. So of course, this adorable toddler who kind of resembled my adorable toddler back in the day. Um, was irresistible to me. Um, but I think she really summarizes what would have been Esther's fate had she remained in uh, Wells, Maine and grown up to be a Congregationalist wife and mother like her sisters. Alice Mason, depicted here about 30 years earlier, she's a little bit older than Esther Wheelwright. Um, she still is portrayed as way fancier than any uh, girl in the Wheelwright family would have been dressed as. The Wheelwrights were not a fancy family. They were a frontier family of strivers, and, and uh, uh, whereas this girl is wearing fashionable slashed sleeves, and you know she's decked out in lace with a lace hood, um, not typical toddler gear in most uh, frontier garrisons, believe me. Probably not even typical for her household daily life either. But what I love about this painting is the little apple or peach that she's holding right in front of her uterus, <laughs> which is almost a comically overdetermined view, right, of what women and girls were for in Protestant early America, right? They were there to be the wives and mothers to give birth to uh, a, a, the invader race to conquer North America demographically. And this was understood as the sort of the key advantage uh, French um, French governors and intendants were always, uh, you know, writing horrified letters back and forth, like, oh my God, those people in Massachusetts, they just keep having children, they keep having babies, they're just, they're going to defeat us, not militarily, they're just going to overwhelm us with their numbers. Um, and of course, because of the, the, um, the lack of inherited 
uh, sorry, the lack of acquired immunity that Native peoples had to various European diseases, Eastern Hemisphere diseases, uh, made them, you know, their numbers were shrinking at the same time the Anglo-American populations were growing. But I love this picture because I think it shows a little bit about the expectations and role, very narrow, particular role that women and girls were expected to um, perform in early Protestant colonies. When Esther was taken captive by the Norwich Wabanaki, though, I think it's a mistake uh, merely to sort of invert the categories of captivity versus um, redemption or liberation, right? I mean, that would have been the more typical feminist move, right, to say that, well, she was oppressed by her Protestant uh, community, and now she can be free among Native peoples, right? But as I began to learn more and more about uh, the Wabanaki, they have a very particular etiquette especially regarding relations between the sexes. So they have a very strong tradition of sex segregation um, for particular rituals and particular observances. They practice menstrual seclusion, right? So, so there's a time every month when women would be absented from their families and they would go live separately. Uh, and I thought this was really a powerful and interesting um, connection, perhaps, to the life that Esther would eventually find herself in, in a convent school, right, in a community of all girls and all women. The Wabanaki people who captured her probably uh, were not keeping her as a prisoner of war. They almost undoubtedly, because of her sex and her age, she was very fortunate because of her sex and her age. She, she almost undoubtedly was adopted and loved as a daughter, as, as a child in a family. And the people that adopted her, although they were um, struggling to survive demographically and were um, suffering from waves of epidemics and from starvation, you know, the war, starvation, and um, disease all are this vicious cycle that can really hollow out a population very quickly. Um, nevertheless, in happier times, uh, in wealthier times, they were completely integrated into the trade networks in early North America. So you can see here in this image by James Peachy from later in the 18th century, they're wearing trade cloth and they're just loaded with trade silver. Look how rich these folks are. They've got beautiful guns. The men are just dripping with silver, with the gorgets and ear bobs. The one has all kinds of trade silver rings sewed to the bottom of his sash. And you can see the same rings sewn onto the, the um, hood that the uh, adult woman, the senior woman in the canoe is uh, wearing here. These Wabanaki hoods are typically made of felted wool, very heavy, very insulating against the wet uh, snow and rain of the colonial Northeast, very warm. Um, and they're frequently decorated very elaborately as this one is with, with silk row grain ribbon. Uh, and again, with the trade silver rings uh, and other sort of valuable emblems When Esther was brought to Quebec in 1709, 1708, and enrolled in the Ursuline Convent School in 1709, she really was kind of put at the heart of the town there. I don't know if any of you have ever vis visited Quebec, but this is the center of the Haute-Ville, the upper city. And this building here that's labeled the Citadel, this is an English language map that was produced after Arnold's attempted invasion, so forgive me for not using a French map. But this is what the, would have been the, the uh, Chateau Saint-Louis, the governor's home, uh, which is where Esther initially was, was dropped off along with a bunch of motley people, you know, prisoners of war, diplomats, people just passing through would stop at the governor's house uh, and receive some kind of room and board, at least for a time. She didn't live there long. She was walked very within a couple of months over to the Ursuline Convent School and enrolled along with one of the, the, the governor's young daughters. The Ursulines you can see here, you know, so, so you see Esther is choosing a life of enclosure after her captivity with the Wabanaki, which is something I think that a lot of secular people struggle to understand. Um, one of the reasons I think she was probably drawn to the Ursulines, do you know what all of these things are around here surrounding the convent? Yes, orchards, gardens. The Ursulines ate so well. And this is a little girl <laughs> who would have 
probably endured some degree of starvation. For, for the rest of her life, the Ursulines believed she was a year or two younger than she actually was because I think she was a little shrimp. I think she was a little undernourished shrimp. I mean, because she lived with them in these critical years of, you know, childhood growth and, and uh, you know, strength acquisition. Uh, but yes, they were incredibly well fed. And their, their, their convent school had, like, extremely low rates of death from any kind of disease because the girls were just so fabulously fed, I think. Which is, I mean, it's not a small consideration in 18th century North America in the, amidst the, uh, the, the little ice age, right? All right, so, so Esther's at the convent now. This is a life within walls and sort of enclosed again in many respects, not unlike the English garrison in which she began her life. Um, this is a map of the Ursuline convent drawn in 1833, but it represents the convent as Esther would have known it throughout most of her life. But as in most other convents, I believe, um, hierarchy is expressed by proximity to the chapel. So here's the chapel, but here's the father confessor's office. Here's the mother superior's office. Here's the choir nuns uh, living in uh, dormitory space. The students of the boarding school lived here. Uh, the kitchen, right, where the, the labor of the servant sisters, the converse sisters, is, is almost exactly opposite the chapel, right? Uh, and then here's the sort of recreation spaces for the novices and the nuns. This is the novice house. Uh, I don't know what E is anymore. <laughs> Probably says in my book somewhere. Uh, and then, of course, F here is the choir. And the outbuildings, this is where servants and domestic animals were kept. The servants and the stables, people who are not part of the order and not part of the school, they're just entirely outside of the, of the convent. One of the most fascinating things I found in the course of researching my, my book, which I foolishly decided to start writing from Colorado about Quebec, <laughs> not a very smart move for an associate professor who eventually wanted to become professor, um, <laughs> was, I mean, I did a lot of research, as we do these days, over the internet. Uh, so it's not all misogyny and religious prejudice. <laughs> but a, a lot of the good stuff on the internet is, is in a lot of hidden corners that you might not ordinarily find yourself uh, directed to by Twitter. Um, but I found this fascinating video. This is a still from the video here. Um, and this was a, a, an older nun, an older religious woman. And I, I think I met her when I was doing some of my research. She dressed up a young woman, not a young nun, but I think a young volunteer in the habit of an 18th century nun. So I think this shows how nuns' lives are not only enclosed you know, with architecture and space, as in that outline of the convent or the outline of the city I showed you, but really down to the very skin, right? You know, the very fibers that enclose their bodies were all sort of very programmatically designed and chosen. What I really found fascinating was the the many layers of cloth that went over the head and especially around the ears and restricted the vision. Because you've got the, the cap secured by the band and then the wimple and then the veil. And it really restricts your vision and hearing. And with the layers of fabric, you can imagine, you know, it's kind of like when you put your ears, you know, you cover your ears like this or have headphones on, you know, all of this, it's this very interior experience of your own body and of the prayers and the songs you would be singing. But this is just one of the many similarities that I found, right? Look at that Wabanaki hood. Look at that Ursuline veil. I'm not saying that the one was necessarily influenced by the other. I don't think we can ever prove that. But it's just these little details when you look across cultures that you can see how a little girl might go from being a little Puritan girl, a Wabanaki child, and then how life in a convent school with people, with adults who are wearing ho hoods or veils like this, you can see how that would make sense. It would not necessarily feel foreign or uncomfortable. And again, with the, the, the tradition of sex segregation that was important in both Wabanaki and European Catholic culture. Another powerful similarity between the Wabanaki women and the Catholic women that, uh, the French Catholic, French Canadian Catholic women that Esther Wheelwright chose to spend the rest of her life with was their devotion to artistry and of using um, found materials, North American materials to express these 
um, European Christian ideas. So at the top you see a wampum belt, um, not a porcelain collar, <laughs> right? The French is not exactly, a <laughs> there's no word in French for wampum belt other than collier porcelain. Um, uh, this is made by Wabanaki women at the turn of the, eight, sorry, turn of the 18th century, um, a gift to the Virgin from the Abenaki, is what that says, I think, in my very uh, Google Translate Latin. Um, <laughs> and uh, that now is in the, the cathedral at Chartres. Yeah, yeah. The, and uh, this little box is emblematic of a number of little birch bark boxes uh, that were made by the Ursuline nuns. It looks like something that's very indigenous, or like, like, like a Native American craft. But in fact, they use the European sort of techniques and technology of embroidery, but North American materials with the birch box, porcupine, and a number of these are also embroidered with moose hair. As you, if you've ever seen a moose, they don't have long, shaggy fur, right? You have to, I, uh, when I read about this moose hair embroidery, you have to thread a needle to do one stitch. You only get one stitch out of every, so that's all, you can imagine the toll it took on their vision to do that kind of laborious work. But these little, little um, bibelot, these little sort of, these became uh, little items for the tourist trade that helped uh, the Ursuline convent survive the British occupation uh, and into, um, into uh, being a, the first ever British colony where Catholicism was, was lawfully able to be practiced. So just to conclude here, um, she ended her life uh, after serving nine years as Mother Superior. She was elected one year after the British conquest um, and she supervised the convent not only at a time when the city was occupied by the British, but her very convent was occupied by the British military governor. Um, governor James Murray requisitioned it as a military hospital for four years, in part because it had survived the shelling of Quebec all through the summer of 1759, fairly intact. And he put his headquarters right in that, uh, in that space. And I believe she ensured her order's survival uh, and even prosperity under uh, the threat of very anti-Catholic imperial rule. Because remember, for 15 years, from 1759 to 1774, French Catholics in Quebec did not know if they would be permitted to remain at home, right? You know, the, the, the Acadians of Nova Scotia were expelled earlier in the 18th century. They didn't know if they'd even be able to keep their homes, let alone if they would be able to practice their religion, have ordained priests, et cetera. So I really wonder to what extent we really owe Esther Wheelwright uh, the credit for uh, the, the religious, um, I won't say toleration, but the, the religious uh, favor granted to French Catholics to practice their religion in the Quebec Act of 1774. As many of you probably know, the Quebec Act is considered by Anglo-American Protestant historians uh, to be one of the so-called intolerable acts, right? That led pretty directly to the shooting war that we know as the American Revolution. Um, <laughs> so it was a great victory for Esther Wheelwright and for Catholics in Quebec. Um, maybe in the end it was a victory for, the, for what became the United States as well, but it was, uh, it was certainly um, hotly controversial for there to be lawful Catholicism in a British colony. So to conclude, at last, I, I really urge us all to be as open and as hashtag vast <laughs> as you possibly can be about the subjects and sources that you write about. I really strongly urge you to also think beyond traditional archives and traditional sources. Be brave, go into an archive, uh, call up a, a document in a language that you don't yet fully understand. Take a picture of it, write it down copy it, see what you can do with it uh, when you take it home and get some help with the translation if you need it or after you do some Duolingo or, or um, something like that to learn a new language. In the end, I think history really depends on the questions that we ask. Uh, and if we assume that Catholic, religious, and lay women are important in our history and worthy of our attention, then I think we can make them so. Thank you very much.
And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to uh, try to answer them or engage with you or solicit other input. We have microphones up here if you'd like to come up and ask. Yes. How was it that she went from the, the Indians to got into the continent? I didn't get that transition on that. Oh, I kind of fudged that one a little bit. Um, <laughs> but we don't, in fact, know. So what we know is that um, she's taken captive in 1703. And I don't have any direct information about her experiences from 1703 until her name appears on the convent student rolls in January of 1709. But we also know that um, there is a priest who's one of a pair of brothers, Vincent and Jacques Bigot, who have a 30 year long at this point relationship with the Wabanaki and who've been bringing Wabanaki girls to the Ursuline convent to enroll them as students. And one of them, Jacques, was recalled to Quebec to do an administrative job for the Jesuits. And so in, in October of 1708, so I think it's almost certain that he took her with him. I can't prove it. All I can do is try to sort of line up these two facts. So yes, I was totally, um, I was totally fudging that. <laughs> but that's, that's at least what I, what I believe to have happened. And, and until more evidence appears, um, and for which I would be grateful to have a, a clearer sense of how that actually happened. I think that's how it happened. But I think because of the relationship that the Bigo brothers had with the Wabanaki people, and because they, they mutually were serving in missions throughout Acadia throughout these years, from the early 1780, sorry, 1680s uh, until uh, Jacques' death, at least, in 1711, um, that there's just a lot of traffic back and forth. Yes. Hi. Um, you know that I really love your book. So, um, thank you. I, I, I just want to get you to kind of speculate on something. Um, obviously, this is a kind of idiosyncratic story of uh, this woman in the sense that there weren't too many people who took the path in life that she did. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about, I think you do a very good job of it, by the way. Um, but can you talk about how you take a story that in some ways is, if not unique, somewhat atypical, and derive historically persuasive generalizations from them? Okay, you know, what, yeah. Right, right. So the question, for those of you who might not have heard that, is how can somebody who's so exceptional in American and Canadian history um, also represent more typical women's experiences. Do I get that right? Is that no, no, but, but are, are you, what are you trying to, what are we supposed to take away from this story that goes beyond the story of this one individual and tells us something more broadly about women's experience in this time or whatever? In other words, we can take a case study like this how, what the larger picture, because I think you do a good job of it, so I'd like you to sort of talk about how you grapple with that. I thought a lot in the course of writing, this, oh, so there's a question about the, the utility of microhistory for telling larger stories about American history. Okay, yes. So I grappled with this a lot while I was writing the book, and this is a popular question when I would have, you know, uh, interlocutors uh, about this project. You know, is she typical? Is she exceptional? And I guess I came down on the side of being comfortable with her being exceptional. <laughs> um, but I also think that, that Americans have a very um, uh, large and unslakeable appetite for stories of exceptional people, right? Uh, and that's in part why it was important to me for Yale University Press, which as you might know is a very big sort of British history, British art history press, to put a, an oil painting of a nun on the cover of one of their books. <laughs> Because if you go to Barnes and Noble, if you go to the um, Shaheen bookstore and look in their history section, you're going to find, you know, David McCullough biographies of every founding father, Joseph Ellis biographies of every founding father, and they all have the oil painting on the cover, right? None of those guys are, are representative of very much, right? They're all exceptional. 
And so I wanted to tell a story that was about an exceptional woman, but also about how sh I think she, I think what I try to communicate is that she, she's not exceptional in her origins, but she makes exceptional use of whatever gifts and talents and opportunities that she, that, that she has by virtue of her special experiences, perhaps much like the founders, right? You know, s these guys are, are uh, typical in some respects, uh, very privileged in many respects, but they all sort of had something special that they gave to the effort, whatever it was, military effort, statecraft, uh, in the late 18th century. And I thought it was important to make an argument that there are these exceptional, powerful women's stories along these lines as well. So I, I hope that that's, I hope that that's, that's helpful. <laughs> I love it, yes, that is perfect. No, she didn't, she did not. Great, I love it. Yes. Do you know what relationship she kept or didn't with the Wabanaki after she went to the school and then the convent? And that's a, you know, the schools later are, are not, those are not place, nice places, right? Like Canada's going through this whole reconciliation process into the, the residential schools. Yeah. The residential schools. But I think yeah. historically that comes a little bit later. But yes. I'm kind of fascinated by the, the French Catholic. You know, it's nice to think that there were times we did think well. And so the idea that that, it was, that there was some respect and affection there is, um, God, you'd like to hold on to possibilities of stories like that. So anyway, I'm just curious about where in that generally awful history does this stuff fit. Yeah, so the question is about the relationship that, that um, Esther might have been able to maintain with Wabanaki people after she went into the convent and, and as she rose through the leadership uh, and, and also how, you know, sort of considering the background of what we know about residential schools and, uh, you know, schools that were uh, explicitly destructive of Native American families, language, et cetera, et cetera, in the 19th and 20th centuries in both Canada and the United States. Um, unfortunately, uh, I don't have any indication that she had, she maintained any relationships with Wabanaki peoples. But we do know uh, from several Anglo-American captivity narratives that were written by girls and women who were taken captive and then returned to Anglo-American Protestant civilization. If they went, traveled through Quebec frequently, they talk about how, oh, I met this curious individual who claims that she was born an English woman. She is now the head of the nun, you know, the head of the, the nunnery in Quebec. Um, and th they always talk about her in these very sort of um, glowing terms that she was super friendly and she's eager to like let them know who she is. These are my brothers. If you meet them back in Boston, please remember me to them. Um, let them know that you met me. And I think that this indicates that uh, any Wabanaki connections like that, she would also have uh, maximized as well. Um, 